Hi everyone. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about the content in section 11.3 of your textbook, which is about rates of change. And there's two types of rates of change that we're going to be talking about. So just to um, you know, throw the spoiler out here, we're going to be talking about average rates of change which maybe you've seen before if you've taken an algebra class, average rates of, rates of change. And then we're also, a little bit later, we're gonna be talking about instantaneous rates of change. Instantaneous rates of change as well. And so just be aware that we're gonna see both of those concepts in this video. And you know, you should be aware that you calculate these differently and they mean different things. In our first example, suppose you decide to take your own road trip from Midland to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And so between Midland and Santa Fe, there's about 400 miles of driving. And in our example, um, it says that it took you eight hours, eight hours exactly, to go from Midland to Santa Fe in your car. And our first question here says, notice whenever you drive your car, what are the units of measurement that your speedometer uses when you look to see how fast you're driving? So at least in my car, since we live in the United States, um, whenever I look at my speedometer, it tells me that I'm, you know, driving like, let's say 50 miles per hour. So my speedometer says MPH. And so miles per hour, MPH is actually a ratio of miles, and again, per means divided by, miles divided by hours, like this, right? And so MPH actually has sort of a mathematical meaning of the ratio of the distance you're driving um, to the time it takes you to drive that distance. And so for our next question, we're going to use that fact. When we ask, what was your average speed as you made your way from Midland to Santa Fe? Well, again, remember that when we talk about speed, in the US, we're talking about miles divided by hours. The number of miles we drove is 400 miles. Again, we're talking about speed, particularly we're talking about average speed, that's important. So we drove 400 miles total, and then how long did it take us to drive that? Well, it took us eight hours. And so you can do 400 divided by 8, and that is 50. And the units of our 50 is going to be, again, miles divided by hours. So this is going to be 50 miles per hour. And this was the average speed that we drove as we made our way from Midland to Santa Fe. And you know that over the course of about an 8-hour trip, um, you're not going to be driving exactly the same speed the whole time, right? So if your average speed was 50 miles per hour, there were definitely moments during the course of the trip where you were driving slower than that, right? If you're driving through a city um, or if you've just uh, slowed down to approach a stop sign, um, you know, there's definitely times where you are driving slower than 50 miles an hour. And there's also lots of times where you're driving faster than 50 miles per hour, right? So we have some highways in Texas that have speed limits of like 80 miles per hour, or maybe even 85. So in any case, this is just an average speed for the whole trip. Now, it's likely that you made some stops during the trip. So maybe during the course of an eight hour trip, you um, ate lunch. Of course, you had to get gas. Um, maybe stop to use the restroom uh, if you're really unlucky. Maybe you got a flat tire and you had to change your flat tire. And what I want to show you is what would that look like if you graphed it? So we're going to represent distance as a function of time. Distance as a function of time. And so that means whenever I sketch my plane here, my xy plane, my vertical axis is going to represent the distance I've traveled away from Midland and my horizontal axis is going to represent the passage of time.
And so distance, we are using miles to represent distance, and in time, we're using hours. So the beginning of my trip is, of course, zero hours, and the end of my trip is going to be eight hours. And again, the beginning of my trip is zero miles away from home, and at the end of the trip, I will have traveled, um, let's see, 400 miles. And we know that at the very end of the trip, we traveled both eight hours and 400 miles. And so I'm going to put a big dot over here that represents the end of the trip, which happens um, after eight hours have passed and after I've traveled 400 miles. And then, of course, the beginning of the trip is when I've had zero hours pass and traveled zero miles. And so somehow we're going to get from our starting point to our ending point. And what we've suggested is that there's probably a time in here where we ate lunch and a time where we had to uh, refill the gas tank and a time when we had to use the restroom and so on. So all of these stops that I've mentioned, I drew a horizontal line. And maybe why did I draw a horizontal line? Well, this horizontal line for lunch, for example, um, is horizontal here because the beginning and the end take up some amount of time on my time axis, right? So maybe this was like an hour or so for lunch. So some time passes, but I'm actually not making any distance, right? And so this is why it's perfectly horizontal because during this time I haven't moved anywhere, but it is taking up some time. So begin, uh, sorry, again, um, in between the beginning of the trip and the part where I use the restroom, we are traveling at some rate. And between using the restroom and stopping for lunch, we're traveling at some rate. And, you know, we are actually making distance in between these stops. And so maybe our trip looks something like this. Whenever we plot it, um, on, a, on a plane where my vertical axis is the distance traveled and my horizontal axis is the time elapsed. And let's suppose that there were some parts of the trip in which I was driving faster. So during the times when I was driving faster, what change would that make in this sort of graph that we drew? Well, if I'm covering more distance and less time, right, so we have a faster speed in terms of miles per hour, um, that would mean that this graph is going to be steeper. So when my speed is increased, we're talking about the rate of change in distance per time, right? So we're covering more distance in the same amount of time. Um, our graph would actually look steeper. If it takes us a shorter time to cover the same distance, our graph would look steeper. And then again, new question, during those times when we were driving slower, what change would that make in the graph? Well, um, my graph would actually be more shallow, or you might be saying uh, the graph would be less steep, or something like this, um, during the times when you're driving slower. And then before we move on to our second example, I want to point this out and say it out loud for you guys. Um, speed, when we talk about speed, that's the rate of change of distance along our route. Let me say that again. Speed is just the rate of change of distance along your route. And so if you have a, if you're traveling at a high speed, then that means the rate of change of distance is high. So your distance is going to be um, moving up very rapidly over time. If you're moving very slowly, then your distance is changing slowly. Okay, and so if we talk about then average speed, then we're talking about the average rate of change of distance. And so that's why this little um, chapter in your book, in chapter or section 11.3, the section is titled Rates of Change, um, and that's why I'm talking about speed in the context of rate of change, is because average speed would be the average rate of change of distance. Here's our second example. So. When I drove to work this morning, I started out by driving 200 feet from my driveway to my first stop sign. So in my neighborhood, I've got a stop sign right at the end of the street. I stop there every morning. 
And it takes me, let's say, 14 seconds to drive that 200 feet from my driveway to the stop sign. And I want to point out something, and that is whenever I start driving away from my driveway, I'm starting from a full stop. So my car is, is stopped after I'm done backing out of the driveway. And then I speed up to some speed, and then I again have to slow down as I approach the stop sign, and I come to a complete stop again at the stop sign. So if I were to graph my distance from my driveway versus time, so this again, my horizontal axis is going to represent the passage of time, this time in seconds rather than hours, and my vertical axis is again going to represent distance, but in this example we'll say that distance is going to be measured in feet. You can see that after 14 seconds pass, I've traveled 200 feet, but um, here my speed, if you really think about it, is actually going to be changing over time, whereas at the beginning here, this is actually a relatively shallow slope to my curve, and over here again, the slope of the curve is relatively shallow, and again this is because I'm actually moving slower. Whenever I'm accelerating from a stop, or I'm decelerating into a stop, my car is not going to be moving as fast as it does here in the middle of the trip. And so this is actually a relatively steep part of my trip here in the middle, and of course it makes sense that my car should be moving fastest in between my driveway and the stop sign, where I'm actually at a full stop. So this is what the, this is what the plot looks like. And I'm also going to provide you a table of values. So here, in this table, I've got time in the first row and distance traveled in the second row. So after two seconds, I've traveled um, 11 feet. And after eight seconds, I've traveled 122 feet. And of course, then after 14 seconds have passed, I've traveled the full 200 feet. Here are some questions. What is my average speed for the first two seconds of my drive? So for the first two seconds, we're talking about um, the time between whenever time is at zero seconds and when time is equal to two seconds. We're talking about this interval here. And when we ask what was my average speed, we see speed and we think, as Americans, you know, we think speed is in miles per hour. So we think miles divided by hours. But of course, that's not our units for this problem. We're actually talking about feet per second, right? So instead of miles, we're talking about distance in feet. And um, instead of hours, our unit of time is going to be seconds. So we're thinking about feet per second. Okay, so what distance was traveled during these first two seconds? Well, in the end, I was driving, sorry, <laughs> I can't write and think at the same time, average speed. So at the end of these two seconds, I had traveled 11 feet, and at the beginning of these two seconds, I had traveled zero feet. And time-wise, my time interval in seconds, at the end of this interval, it had been two seconds of my trip, and at the beginning of this interval, it had been zero seconds. And so I have 11 divided by two, which is like five and a half feet per second. So the answer to this question what is my average speed for just the first two seconds? Well, for just the first two seconds of my drive, my average speed was five and a half feet per second. Okay, so now let's move on and we'll ask this next question. What is my average speed for the two seconds between t equals six and t equals eight? Here's t equals six. Here's t equals 8, and you can see 2 seconds elapsed between 6 and 8. And this is my distance where I'm at in my car between 6 and 8 seconds. And so we're going to calculate this the same way. So my average speed in this problem 
we're going to do distance up top. And in this case, for my distance, at the end of this interval, I had traveled 122 feet. And at the beginning of the interval, I had traveled only 79 feet. So the difference in the distance I had traveled, well, that's going to be how long I've traveled during this particular interval. And then again, in the denominator, we're going to put our time that it took us and our time elapsed. At the end of the interval was eight seconds, and of course, minus six seconds, because that's when we started our interval. And so what do I get up top? Well, 122 minus 79, I think is 43. Just double checking, and yeah, I think it's 43. And then of course, two seconds have passed. And so we traveled 43 feet over the course of two seconds, and so then um, actually making the division here gives me 11. No, that's not right. 21, 21.5 feet per second. So the answer to the question, what was my average speed for those two seconds between t equals six and t equals eight? Well, my average speed this time was 21.5 seconds, feet per second, sorry. Which means I was traveling about four times as fast as I was during the first two seconds of my drive. And so that makes sense, because again, I was accelerating from a stop. So after I've accelerated a bit, I'm actually traveling faster here in the middle. Okay, new question. What is my instantaneous speed at time t equals 10. And notice I'm asking a different question. I'm not asking about average speed anymore. I'm asking about instantaneous speed. And at time t equals 10, we know we have some kind of notion of instantaneous speed because at this point along my trip, when time is equal to 10, I could have looked down while I was driving at my speedometer and you know that the needle on my speedometer would have been pointing to something, right? So here's a bad drawing of my speedometer. And you know, let's say this is like, you know, 30 miles per hour or whatever the speed measurement is. My needle on my speedometer has to be pointing somewhere, maybe between like 20 and 30 miles per hour, I don't know. Um, but it was, you know, we know that my car had some kind of speed at this point. And yet, all we know how to do so far is calculate average speed between some certain interval. And so let me pose this idea to you. If I don't know how to calculate instantaneous speed, but I do know how to calculate average speeds given some time interval, what if I take a time interval that's just really, really short and really close to time t equals 10? Like, would anyone notice if instead of taking the instantaneous speed at time t equals 10, would anyone notice if I instead calculated the average speed between t equals 10 and t equals 10.0001, right? So what I'm suggesting is consider the time interval between t equals 10 and one tenth of a millisecond after t equals 10. So, you know, an unimaginably short period of time has passed. Would anyone actually notice the difference if I just used that average speed and called it the instantaneous speed at time t equals 10? Probably not, honestly. And so we're going to explore this idea a little bit more. And we're gonna actually take this moment to give the precise mathematical definitions of what we mean in this class when we talk about average rate of change and instantaneous rate of change.
So anytime in this class, when we're talking about a function and you're asked about the average rate of change of that function, this is what we're talking about. Well, first of all, an average has to be over some interval. And so we call A the start point of your interval, and B the end point of the interval. And the way we're gonna calculate this is the value of the function at the end point minus the value of the function at the start point. divided by the end point minus the start point. So I've just written out in words what we mean by this formula here. So we're going to evaluate the function at both the start and end point and we are going to consider what is the difference between the start and end point. And just to relate this back to what we've been talking about, we've been talking about a distance function as you drive in your car, right? So in the case of our examples from before, B would be the ending time and A would be the starting time. That means in our examples from before, B minus A would be the time that's elapsed during our, um, you know, during our drive. And again, when we are using the distance function, talking about our trips in the car, F of B, would be the amount of you know distance we're counting at the end of our trip, and then f of a would be the distance we've traveled at the beginning of the interval, or at the beginning of our trip. And then that means f of b minus f of a, which is the, the quantity we find in the numerator, that would be the total distance traveled during the interval. So again, it's distance traveled divided by time elapsed. But this is just generalizing that idea of the average rate of change. Okay, now I will talk about the instantaneous rate of change and how we might go about calculating the instantaneous rate of change. And first of all, just look at and appreciate that the instantaneous rate of change has in it a limit, which we just learned about limits in the past several videos. We're taking the limit as h approaches zero of our function f evaluated at the point x plus h minus our function f evaluated at the point x, all divided by h. And again, one more thing I want you to notice before we move on is that here we're dividing by h. So I can't just set h equal to zero and evaluate the whole thing, right? That's not going to work for this limit because this expression that we're taking, um, this expression here does, is not defined at the point h equals zero. And so we're going to have to be a little bit more clever um, when we evaluate this limit. And again, before we move on, I want to take a moment to talk about how did we get this formula for the instantaneous rate of change. And I'm going to start with the average rate of change formula, and we're going to let h equals b minus a, and, and just see where this takes us for a moment. So if I start with the average rate of change formula, it's still visible up here, by the way. Average rate of change is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. But considering this fact here, I'm going to let h equal b minus a. And what I'll do is I'm going to add a to both sides of this equation. So I have h plus a equals b. And then I'm going to subtract h from both sides. No, never mind. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm just going to rearrange this a little bit. So I'll put b on the left side of the equation, and then the right side of my equation um, can be a plus h, like that. This is supposed to be a b. So 
what do I have now? I can write f of b. I can use this identity here to rewrite this as f of a plus h minus f of a. And then in the denominator, I have that b minus a is equal to h. So I'll use this identity in the box to rewrite b minus a as h. And this right here already looks like what I have written on the inside of my instantaneous rate of change limit. Now, why are we taking the limit as h goes to 0? Well, that's because h is going to be the difference between b and a. Remember, um, this is my end point, and this is my start point. And so if I let the difference between my endpoint and start point approach zero, I'm saying let's take a very a smaller and smaller interval over which we're doing the average. And again, I'm going to scroll up just a moment and remind you that when we were asking about my instantaneous speed as I was driving in the car at a certain point in time, I asked you the question, would anybody notice if instead of taking the instantaneous speed, what if I instead actually calculated an average speed? Because I know how to do that. What if instead I just calculate the average speed on a really small interval? If the interval is small enough, then nobody's going to know. And if nobody's going to know, that's good enough for us, right? So we're just going to let this interval between a and b approach zero. So we'll let it be something really, really tiny. And here I wrote like one tenth of a millisecond. But you get the idea that the reason this limit is h approaching zero is because I'm letting that time interval actually approach zero. I'm letting it be very, very tiny. OK, so now let's do an example using this instantaneous rate of change formula because I've introduced it, but we haven't actually used it yet. And so I know everyone's excited to see this in action here. Example 3 says, what is the instantaneous rate of change of the function f of x is equal to x squared at the point x equals 5? So I have a function, I'm naming it f of x, and the function is just squaring the input. But again, we're asking what is the instantaneous rate of change? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this formula for the instantaneous rate of change um, down here where I can work with it. So um, that was the limit as h approached 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. OK. Now, since my function is saying whatever x is, we're just going to square it. Whenever I evaluate that function at f of x plus h, now our input is x plus h. And so what we're squaring is actually x plus h just based on this function definition that we were given. And now x plus h squared. I'm going to take that out to the side here with a little box because it helps me multiply factors that have more than one term. So I have x plus h on top, and then I'll write x plus h on the side. So in this first box on the top left, x times x is x squared x times h is going to be hx. Again, x times h is going to be hx. And then h times h is h squared. And then to finish your multiplication, you just add up these four boxes. And you can get x squared plus 2 times hx plus h squared. So this is what we're going to write when we see f of x plus h. right? When we evaluate this function f, at the point x plus h, this will be the value. So going back here, I'm going to rewrite limit as h approaches 0 of, and then instead of f evaluated at x plus h, 
I'm going to replace that with our newfound description here, our value, which is going to be x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. Now here, going back to our um, definition of the instantaneous rate of change, I have minus f of x. But again, by our definition, f of x is x squared. And so I'm going to write minus x squared. I will divide by h just like it says to, and then close parentheses. OK. Again, I cannot just set h equal to 0. Because if I do that, and I set h equal to 0, well, then my denominator has an h in it. And so my denominator would be 0. And I cannot divide by 0. So we can't just directly evaluate this limit. But maybe we notice here that um, that numerator has an x squared, a positive x squared here, and a negative x squared over here. So x squared minus x squared, that would cancel. And so um, after making that cancellation, let's see what we get. We still have 2hx plus h squared in the numerator, and then still h in the denominator. And if you're really keen on algebra, you think my numerator has a common factor between the two terms of my numerator. So let me factor out that common factor of my numerator. And so what we'll find is we have h, the greatest, or the, yeah, the, the greatest common factor of the two terms of my numerator would be h times 2x plus h. And you can double check using the distributive property that these are actually the same and equal to each other. And now you might say, well, I have an h factor in my numerator and an h factor in my denominator. And so those will cancel out to 1. And we are getting really, really close to figuring out the truth here. So I'm changing pin colors in anticipation of our answer. Canceling those h's gives the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h. And now, if we let h go to 0, like our limit tells us, this is just 2x. That's not too bad. And in fact, we're very, very close now. We're asked the question, what is the instantaneous rate of change of our function f of x equals x squared at the point x equals 5? And so if I use this fact, x equals 5, this is 2 times 5, which is 10. And so the answer to our question here, what is the instantaneous rate of change at the point x equals 5? Well, that answer is going to be um, the number 10. So kind of neat, kind of a neat application of limits and, and maybe jogging your memory about what it means to um, use functions. But um, yeah, so this is one application of limits. You know, we've learned about limits and now you've seen an application is being able to figure out what is the instantaneous rate of change of a function, which is, again, it's useful in the real world because we describe so many things with functions, whether you're, you know, in economics or if you're in business or if you're in engineering or any of these related fields. Um, we do like to use functions to describe the world around us. And if you're curious about rates of change and you already have a function that models the world around you, um, this is how you deduce those rates of change. And by the way, this does not just apply to the point x equals 5. You could actually take the point x equals anything at all, right? So at the point x is equal to 1, what would be the rate of change, right? Well, it would be 2 times 1, so it would be 2. So this actually found us a formula for determining the instantaneous rate of change at any point x. So pretty useful. Example four. So this is the last thing we'll do.
for the in, in the lesson. And again, going back to average rates of change, right? So remember, I told you at the beginning, we're going to learn about average rates of change and instantaneous rates of change. And, and keeping in your head that those are different, they have different formula that we use to describe average and instantaneous rates of change. Well, this question asks, what is the average rate of change of the stock price of ExxonMobil from January 1st of 2018 to today? So we're going to write down what is that formula for the average rate of change. It is the value of your function at the end point minus the value of your function at the start point divided by the end point minus the start point. And in the denominator here, the end point would be today, which for me is um, January 22nd, 2022. And then the start point is given to us. Uh, that would be January 1st of 2018. And then f of b and f of a, well, that's actually talking about the stock price of ExxonMobil at these dates, right? And so let's find out what was the stock price today and what was the stock price on January 22nd? Or sorry, what was the stock price at uh, January 1st of 2018? And so this can be found, I think, um, very quickly using Google. So in Google, we are just going to search uh, XOM. And our search tells us that um, today, right now, the stock price is $72.17. Let me write that down before I forget it. So 72.17. And let's see what the stock price was on January 1st of 2018 or at least as, as close as we can get there. So here is 2018. And at least on January 5th, the stock price was 87.52. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use Microsoft Excel to answer these questions because um, more math than I want to do to actually uh, punch those in. So here's an Excel workbook and my numbers are 7217 equals 72.17 minus 87.52. And so the change in stock price was uh, $15.35. And uh, the change in time, the amount of time that's elapsed, um, this is going to be the difference between January 22nd of 2022 and also January 1st of 2018. And so taking the difference here, says that about 1,482 days have passed. So if we take the, you know, if we just divide these now, so numerator divided by denominator, that would be the rate of change in dollars per day. And it's kind of a small number and that's maybe not how we like to think about stocks because in a long-term investment, maybe you're more likely to think about years, right? And so I'm just going to change this dollars per day into dollars per year. And this will be our answer. So what we have is 72.17 minus 87.52. That gives me minus 15.35 in the numerator. And in terms of days in the denominator, well, it turns out 1482 days have passed. And instead of dollars per day, what I want to get is um, dollars per year. 
you know, what was the stock price change in dollars per year? And so I will multiply by the number of days per year, which is about 365. And this is going to give me the number negative 3.78 dollars per year. So since January 1st, 2018, the stock price of ExxonMobil has been decreasing by $3.78 per year. Um, and this is on average, right? So again, going back to the idea of average rate of change, you can see this little um, stock trend for ExxonMobil whenever you Google search XOM. And so you see, well, in 2018, um, it looks like they've had their downs and ups and 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 downs. And down. Of course, COVID, big down, um, a little bit up and then down again, and then coming back now after COVID. So whenever we consider the average rate of change, we're only considering the change, the rate, excuse me, we're only considering the stock price here and here. We're kind of ignoring all the stuff that happens in between. And so um, if you were to ask what's the instantaneous rate of change, you would want to take a really, really, really small time interval and sort of do the same calculation. And in mathematics, in the language of calculus, that is exactly what we use the limit for.